We're excited about today's sponsor, TBR. You might say, Jeremy, you sin reading. And TBR is clearly a book subscription service that customizes book recommendations for you or your loved ones so they get fresh new titles delivered to their door or inbox, making reading easy. And honestly, holy sh**, good on you for knowing so much about what Book Ride has been up to with their TBR book subscription service. So yes, we sin reading, but our staff loves to read, and we also appreciate books because they inspire so much of the content that we consume. TBR eliminates the frustration of selecting new book titles by tailoring new books just for you. The best part is you don't have to enjoy reading to use TBR. You know someone who loves reading new books, and they would certainly appreciate a unique gift from you. TBR is the perfect gift for your mom, sister, mister, or really anyone that picks up a book. You never have to leave the couch to look like the real hero of the gift-giving hour. Go to their site, linked in the description, and click on Give the Gift of TBR. TBR works for any genre, and you can give it as a gift or sign up yourself right now. Go to mytbr.co with no M on the end. Fill out the questionnaire, and then get a book picked by a pro. Links are in the description. Now go read something. Two minutes and five seconds of credits and clouds that do nothing for nobody. Oh, you might like the title song, but mainly you're just going to be confused. The movie Wolfgang Peterson did before this was Das Boot. <laughs> ah, I dreamed this weird dream with clouds and credits and what the f*** is a wolf gang? This kid didn't close the bread back up after he took a piece out. And there are two stray green apples just milling about on the table. Holy f***, is that butter? That is a giant ass stick of f***ing butter. Major dad's a freak, near the window, sipping on egg and juice, laid back. We can't let mom's death be an excuse for not getting the old job done, right? being dead inside. It says that you are drawing horses in your math book. Unicorns. They are unicorns. Nitpicking, just for the sake of it. I'm very disappointed that you didn't even try out for the swimming team. Someone better kill this heartless motherfucker soon or I'm gonna jump into the movie and beat his fucking ass myself. You say you love horses and yet you seem to be afraid to get on a real one. I love whales and spaceships and cacti, but you couldn't pay me enough to get on one. Hey, it's the weirdo! It wouldn't be the 80s without a kid getting bullied on his way to school. Also, is this street closed for a festival or something? Is that why it's available for free market bully interactions without fear of traffic? Put that away! Which way? How did they lose him? Sure, they had to run through a crowd of people, but they were still on his tail. Did they get lost in the movie's editing? Also, accidentally hiding in a shop that will change your life. They want to throw me in the garbage. Why don't you give him a good punch in the nose? Bookstore owner thinks that a kid can regularly take on three bullies by giving them a good punch on the nose. I guess bullies tend to line up like Larry, Moe, and Curly, and if you punch one, you punch them all. Roll acknowledgments. This guy apparently hates kids, but he loves shoplifters. He steals the key to the attic like he's done it a thousand times. But then, once he gets up there, he gawks and looks around like a first-timer. Bastion makes sure that he removes the key from the attic door, but definitely doesn't close the door all the way. Reading. Excuse me, would it be alright if I joined you this evening? <laughs> Dude, if you wanted to join them, why did you nearly run them over a minute ago? How many hit and runs has the Rockbiter done over the years? The movie's going to portray him as a gentle giant, but he's got some skeletons in that rocky segue for sure. They should have called this guy Frag, I'm Rock. I've been traveling all day. And by traveling, he means utterly decimating everything in my path. Now I see why you pit this camp. If you're Bastion, who was told this book was dangerous, and the first few sentences set up what sounds like a horror story, only to shift gears and become Jim Henson goes to camp, wouldn't you maybe just go take the math test instead? A delicious-looking limestone rock. Cannibalism. Where I come from in the north. Something like a deep dive into new characters and situations, followed by immediate exposition. Did the lake dry up? No, it just wasn't there anymore. Nothing was there anymore. Not even a dried up lake. So when this nothing was taking over all the somethings of the world, there was a place where you could observe the nothing? Did you see the nothing eating stuff up from your vantage point, or did it just stop for a while so it could remain mysterious? What you have told us is also happening where I live in the West! Wait a minute, the rockbiter started telling everyone what was happening, and Teeny Weeny was like, did the lake dry up? And the rockbiter was like, no, that's stupid. And then he asked, was the lake a hole? And the rockbiter said, nah, that would be something. You. And then as the Rockbiter continued his unbelievable story, this man and snail exchanged glances like they'd never heard of such a thing. But now Teeny Weenie is like, oh wait a minute, that same shit's happening where I come from too. I was just being a dick when I asked you all those questions earlier. A strange sort of nothing is destroying everything. James Corden? It's not just in our part of Fantasia. It's weird that a property in the 80s could have a land called Fantasia without Disney suing them into oblivion. Then why are we all just sitting around here instead of taking off for the ivory tower? Right! Oh. 
What are we waiting for? I guess it took the Rockbiter story, the exact story all of you have, to finally light a fire under your ass about this nothing. I told you to stay awake. Narcoleptic mint like bats. The home of the Empress. She's our only hope. Why? So if the Night Hob was sent by his people to talk to the Empress, why does he have to watch from this vantage point as if he's eavesdropping? Is he not allowed here? There seems to be a mysterious link between her illness and the nothing. We have no basis for claiming that, but it's a short movie, so we are pretty sure we are correct. The plains people who hunt the purple buffalo have among them a great warrior. He alone has a chance to fight the nothing and save us. First off, why do they think a warrior is capable of fighting something they dub the nothing? It's a philosophical void in space and time and imagination, not a purple buffalo. Second off, it's absolutely crazy that Atreyu is the only person willing to fight. I don't care how many people call themselves cowards on this planet, you'd have at least a handful of people who'd try to fight this abstract antagonist. He is our only hope. Well, the Empress was your only hope until a second ago, so forgive me if I don't hold my breath. Look, he suddenly jumped 80 pages in this book. Just before he began reading again, he had clearly only been through maybe a dozen pages. He starts back in about Atreyu arriving and BAM! He's 15% of the way through the whole fucking book. I'm sorry, but this is not the time or place for children. So Atreyu is a great warrior who was famous enough that the Empress set for him specifically, but nobody knows he's a kid? How does a reputation like this get around without someone mentioning that? I'm the only Atreyu of the Plains people. But I'll be happy to go back hunting the purple buffalo. Dude, what kind of threat is this? The nothing is destroying the whole world, which you allegedly live on. You can't do it without, I'll show them when you're part of the realm. No one can give you any advice except this. You must go alone. You must leave all your weapons behind. It will be very dangerous. None of that sounds like advice. Also, this makes no sense. How does bringing weapons nullify the parameters of the quest? Do you have to get past a metal detector? When do I begin? So you're just gonna hear this guy say, go alone, take no weapons, and you don't have any questions about that? It will guide and protect you. <laughs> anyway, but not really. I can't believe they made rules like you must go alone, but they still let him take a horse. No one will be seated while a good 7% of the film's runtime is devoted to a Treyu riding a horse. So, Artax, Artax, where the f*** are we going anyway? A creature of darkness also began his quest. And he was super into the camera work of the Evil Dead. They had been traveling aimlessly for almost a week. What? Aimlessly? They were doing zigzags? Going in circles? Aimlessly literally means without aim. And so I have to wonder what they were hoping to find if they were just going on here making up patterns and shit. Not too much. We still have a long way to go. Kid, you realize you are not a Treyu, right? You can eat as much of that sandwich- Oh, f***ing forget it. So, um, Artax, Artax, where the f*** are we going anyway? Atreyu and Artax had searched the Silver Mountains, the Desert of Shattered Hopes. But they completely ignored the Plateau of Wellness, the Happy Ending Tundra, and the Fjord of Magical Cures. And so there was only one chance left to find Morla, the Ancient One. Holy sh! everything is moving so fast! He searched three places, didn't find the cure, and then gave up and what? Went to the phone a friend? This sh is urgent! If Atreyu knew Morla, the Ancient One, was an option, but instead wasted days searching on his own for a cure, then Atreyu is not only not the hero, he's the devil! Also, this movie is MacGuffin the movie. One new task bait chase after another. We just keep chasing the newest MacGuffin. Artax, you're sinking! Come on! Artax is in this movie for like five minutes and they're already killing him off because if you're a kid, you have to learn about death somehow. And it might as well be in 1984 in a children's fantasy movie about a kid who won't take his math test. Now, if the swamps of sadness swallow you when you're too sad, then why isn't Atreyu sinking right now? Kids! Come on, man! It's taking him longer to get over the horse than the horse had in screen time back when it was alive. Michelle Mountain. Morla. The Ancient One. Thanks, Bastion. I was too busy being sad about our text to remember what this movie told us three minutes ago. This tree's limbs are ladder-like in their convenient spacing. So he read, Atreyu climbed a tree and beheld a giant turtle, and that was so terrifying he had to scream out loud like he just saw Michael Myers. I know your imagination is running wild, but this is a f***ing turtle head. Huh? But that's impossible. Couldn't have heard me. I disagree. I think everybody heard you, especially the teachers in your school who just discovered a missing attic key and wondered where all that screaming came from. Did you know that the Empress is very ill? Not that it matters, but yes. Listen, asshole, you just said you haven't spoken to anyone in thousands of years. Now you somehow know the Empress is sick? Did you overhear someone talking about it while they casually walk through the swamps of sadness? But you can ask the Southern Oracle. How can I get there? You can't. It's 10,000 miles away.
Earlier in the movie, the Nighthob said that he lived in the South, and that the nothing was there. So even if Atreyu finds something random that can never happen like a luck dragon to take him there, how is the Southern Oracle still around? No, Atreyu wouldn't quit now. You can finish that book at home, you ninny! Movie tries to make it seem like Atreyu is sadder now than he was when Artax died, but even now I don't know why Atreyu isn't sinking yet. I mean, how f***ing sad was that horse when he sank into the swamp? I'm no expert at reading horse emotions, but that horse couldn't have been but a quarter the sadness that Atreyu has been now twice in this movie. Story-wise, why does Gamork come after Atreyu when the swamps of sadness are about to swallow him up anyway? The movie's gonna rejoice in saving Atreyu at the last minute, but the scene works without the double threat of death, does it not? Can it be one or the other? Fortuna ex machina! That's basically luck inside of luck, making this literal luck dragon luckception. I'm a luck dragon. Yeah, you're a dragon, I get that, but are you gonna deny your dog heritage? You are clearly half a dog, and the love story between your father and mother must be incredible. You've already brought me the entire 10,000 miles? No. Only 9,891. As we're about to find out, Falcor could totally fly the rest of the way, but Atreyu is forced to test himself with some bullshit self-awareness gates to get to the Southern Oracle for some reason. Falcor is like the eagles in Lord of the Rings, only somehow more of an asshole. Never give up and good luck will find you. Wrong! Atreyu had totally given up and was about to sink into the swamp when you appeared out of nowhere. So really, it sounds like you should do the opposite of this advice. Of course, that doesn't bring poor Artax back, does it? Just where did you and your dragon come from? Falcor's been here for days and you haven't asked him that question yet? This f***ing Kool-Aid telescope f***ery. Is that the Southern Oracle? Listen, asshole, Falcor told you that you were 109 miles away from the Southern Oracle. Does this look 109 miles away? F*** you. The Sphinx's eyes stay closed until someone who does not feel his own worth tries to pass by. Okay, let's hold the f***ing phone for a minute. There are Sphinxes guarding the path to the Southern Oracle. That alone is a red flag. Wouldn't an Oracle want people to know the truth about the future? Second, the gate of Sphinxes is triggered by bad self-esteem? Why? Why is the truth from the Oracle only available to people that have achieved total zen in the realm of self-worth and self-confidence? What if an asshole cocky guy comes along that feels his own worth too much, like Kid Rock or Bill Nye? Luckily for Atreyu, some random dick tries to to pass through the first gate so that you can see what happens if you fuck it up. No horses were harmed in the filming of this laser death scene. However, back there at the swamp with Artex, can't say the same about that scene, according to our lawyers. I'm gonna try it. No! Don't go yet! I've not told you about the next gate! It's even worse than this one! Atreyu, who is a great warrior, doesn't fucking listen to someone when they tell him about more challenges up ahead. How the f*** do you become a great warrior at 13 when you have this kind of tunnel vision? Atreyu watches a knight die at the Sphinx Gate and instantly decides he's ready for the challenge himself. And he does not take the luck dragon with him! Oh, I see the Sphinx's game now. Distract teenagers with their insanely huge boobs. So wait, the eyes open, indicating that Atreyu has absolutely no confidence in himself, and he's just standing there like a doofus, and then he just runs and dives out of the way of the lasers. This seems to be missing the point of what the challenge was all about. Next is the magic mirror gate. Atreyu has to face his true self. Just gotta say, this challenge doesn't sound too different from the last one, which was bullshit anyway. Confronted with their true selves, most men run away. Screaming! This is only a problem for people who fool themselves. That's why I go to the mirror every morning and say, you have a tiny d and your physical appearance relies heavily on people around you either finding you humorous or being drunk. Your facial hair is sketchy van owner levels, your voice is nasally and pinched, you smell like the opposite of good, and one of your eyebrows looks like a sideways S. Honestly, it really prepares me for anything the world might throw at me later in the course of the day. Brave men discover that they are really cowards! Then how do they pass the first gate if that's the case? Also, I guess everyone who has ever passed through both gates has come back to tell Engi Wook everything they know about it, which I find hard to believe since he lives up high on a mountain. He sure knows a lot about a second gate that he can never observe himself. This look at your true self in the mirror thing feels heavily inspired by Empire Strikes Back's Luke Darth Cave scene. And by inspired, I mean inspired. Once again, we see the story suggesting that Fantasia knows about Bastion. First, Atreyu and Morla could hear Bastion screaming. Now Atreyu can see Bastion in the mirror. But does the book say? Atreyu looked into the mirror and saw Bastion in the school attic reading the book. F***ing show the line in the book, movie! Why is the Southern Oracle a prettier blue version of the deadly sphinxes at the first gate? Maybe the nothing was right to destroy this world, devoid of imagination. Then you must know what can say Fantasia! The Empress needs a new name. This is the most disappointing answer to an important question since Deep Thought came up with 42. Only a human child can give her this new name. 
Luckily, the nothing waited until you got all the way here and got the answer before destroying us. It's a very patient abstract concept, that nothing. Also, this dickhead oracle doesn't even explain how Atreyu can find a human child on such short notice. We know that the book is saying whoever is reading this needs to give the name, but Atreyu, the character, doesn't know a goddamn thing about that. <laughs> And then this asshole, Falcor, apparently flies to the Southern Oracle and picks Atreyu up. What steamy pile of bullshit was keeping Falcor from flying here in the first place? Don't worry. We'll reach the boundaries of Fantasia. Do you know when they are? I have no idea. Eat a d Falcor. You can't just say, we'll get to some place and not know where the f***ing place is. I know you're a luck dragon, but you're also kind of a f dragon. Then how do we find a human child? With luck. <laughs> this movie has a lot of positive concepts like self-worth and self-reliance and these sphinxes giant boobies. But in the end, the movie is really telling us you can have all the positive traits in the world, you're still going to need an ass load of luck. On and on they flew until they reached the Sea of Possibilities. Interestingly, the Sea of Possibilities is unreachable by water because it is connected to the Strait of Sadism and the Lock of Logical Fallacy. Look, Atreo, the nothing! Did Falcor's voice change since the last time we heard it? As Bastion climbs the attic shit to close the storm-opened windows, I have to admire the shitty adulting that led to this moment. We know his mom died, so she's off the hook. But even though Dad was a hard ass at breakfast, he should still have a system in place, hello babysitters, where he would know if his child did not come home from school. Then we have all the teachers that reported this kid missing today, and he had no excuse, so the school, I guess, tried to call the dad maybe one time, and then gave up? If I had missed all my classes in elementary school, the f***ing cops would have eventually descended on the premises. Oh no, I lost that protective necklace that really hasn't done to protect me this entire time. Atreyu, where are you? Wait, are you saying that you didn't guide Atreyu to safety on the beach? That he survived this fall? And was the nothing only located in the upper atmosphere of the planet and left everything underneath alone? They look like big, good, strong hands, don't they? We do not have time for this sh <gasps> Spoilers. If you come any closer, I will rip you to shreds. Heard, but what a line you've chosen to draw. You could eat me right now, and instead you're giving me a wide berth. Why? Is it because I can't die? Or can't I yet? I'm not even this character. I'm just using his voice, but why? I am the Mork. From Gork? People who have no hopes are easy to control. Citation needed. It sounds good. It sounds like a great quote about cultism or any other group, but people who have no hopes are actually hard as hell to control. It's the ones with lots of hope that are easy to fool and therefore control. I am the servant of the power behind the nothing. Movie expects me to believe that the destructive nothing needs a f***ing wolf servant. I lost him in the swamps of sadness. His name was Atreyu. Don't you know this is f***ing Atreyu? If you've been following his scent or his aura, wouldn't you know this is the guy? Atreyu grabs a shard for a weapon, which is a clear violation of the stupid rules of the quest. I probably should remove a sin for this because that rule is so stupid, but rules are rules. God damn, this movie cuts out more of the final fight with Wolf than the Grey did. Also, Gamork Gawaz Gano Gachallenge Gaat Gaal. It's weird that the nothing is being portrayed as a super fierce wind. Also, I feel like at this point Atreyu's dominant personality trait is his ability to hold on to a tree branch during a burst of wind. Only a few fragments of this once rich and beautiful world had been left by the nothing. The nothing is like your roommate Steve that eats a pizza and leaves crusts all over the coffee table. Let the Auron guide you. Things we were told the Auron could do when it was given to Atreyu. A badge that allows one to speak for the Empress. Things we were not told the Auron could do. Point a magic compass towards a dream wishing on hopes. The director said, let's have your character eat an apple after 10 hours of breathing in this school's asbestos. It'll make you look like even more of an asshole. Why the f*** does the Empress's bedroom have a clamshell drawbridge for the door and why does it need to close after Atreyu walks in? Why do you look so sad? F duh, Empress. He has suffered with you. He went through everything you went through. Bastion acts like the book hasn't already recognized his existence twice. Just as he is sharing all your adventures, others are sharing his. They were with him when he hid from the boys in the bookstore. Now the Empress is playing the pronoun game with us, the viewers of the movie. Atreyu doesn't even know what a bookstore is, and he sure as f*** doesn't know who the others might be, referring to us watching a movie. Atreyu is probably the most confused character in the history of goddamn anything. It's a big reveal for Bastion and for the audience, but Atreyu was left in the dark and then he dies. He has to give me a new name. He's already chosen it. He just has to call it out. Jesus. Linda? Mary? Joseph? Mary Joseph? Matilda? Eartha? Bastion. If the guy reading your story fails to recognize he is part of your story, feel free to scream address him directly by name. 
This was Bastion's mother's name? Moonchild? That was the wonderful name? Oh well, who gives a f right? He named the Empress. It doesn't matter if it's Moonchild or Voldemort. He saved the day. Everything's been in vain. No, it hasn't. Fantasia can arise in you. Sounds like Fantasia's had more chances to survive than f***ing Tom Cruise and Edge of Tomorrow. Balcourt's even more beautiful than I thought! Dude, you were the one who imagined this new Fantasia. You're a f***ing liar. What would you like to wish for next? Bastion whispers this sh** to Falcor like it needs to be kept secret 10,000 feet in the air between the two of them. I'm glad Bastion gets back at the bullies, and I'm totally on board with this absolute nonsense being real, but how do you go from flying around the new Fantasia to actual Earth? Is there a portal they went through to get here? Does the portal take you from Fantasia to Vancouver? Also, a minute ago we saw the bullies pointing up at the sky when they saw Bastion and Falcor flying down, and there was a car trying to turn on the street where they were walking, but they didn't care because they're a bunch of asshole bullies. Now that the movie shows them from the air, it appears they're on a completely different street with no crossroad anywhere close behind them. Bastion made many other wishes. Ah, sudden end of movie narrator. You know what would have been scarier than nothing? Anything! I think we should stay. Why? Because I'm in the dumpster already. I carry you. Don't worry, it's a racing snail. Oh. Now this is pod racing. Hello, I'm Emmett. Oh, and this is the piece of resistance. His name? Ot Vandalite. It was not you we sent for. We wanted to betray you. My name's Harry Potter Jr. I just moved into this building. No, that's okay. I'm pretty sure I can struggle my way out. First, I'll just reach in and pull my legs out. Now, I'll pull my arms out with my face. Mm -hmm. I'm not a witch, I'm your wife! <laughs> Dying tickles! Do you suppose the ivory tower is still standing? In the beginning, it is always dark. There is no dark side in the moon, really. Matter of fact, it's all dark. 